Hello, and welcome to another Fireside Chat with Dr. Childress. Um, today, I'm going to be looking at forensic psychology, and this is within my VITA series. And I'm going to be looking, coming forward, at um, VITAs of Dr. Simon and Dr. Stahl. Those are uh, prominent forensic psychologists in the family courts. And they've written the book uh, on custody evaluations and how to conduct them. Uh, in 2013, it was uh, Stahl and Simon, forensic custody, uh, forensic psychology consultation and child custody litigation. And then they did their second uh, edition of the same book, forensic psychology consultation and child custody litigation. This time it's Simon and Stahl. So we have 2020 and 2013 that they've produced uh, the books on this. And the, the subtitle is a handbook for work product review, case presentation, and expert testimony. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is, is sort of a context. And then in later uh, subsequent uh, videos, I'll be taking a look at their vitas and, and to see who they are as professionals since they've essentially defined an entire field of um, practice in the family courts and that's not clinical psychology. They do something different and they're the ones that are telling people what to do here. And the pro what they've developed, this forensic consultation and child custody evaluations that they've developed are extraordinarily problematic. So uh, we're gonna take a look at that a little bit today as a context for the next um, set of, of VITAs that I'll be looking at in the family courts. So to begin with, in taking a look at this, I want to start with uh, the New York Blue Ribbon Commission on Forensic Custody Evaluations. I think this came out in 2021. And there's a link on my slides. You can't link the link because this is a video. But I'm, I want to point out that you can Google it really easily and get the, the New York Blue Ribbon Commission on Forensic Custody Evaluations. And so let's see what this Blue Ribbon Commission found about forensic evaluations like Stahl and Simon are doing. They said, ultimately, the commission members agree that some New York judges order forensic evaluations too frequently and often place undue reliance upon them. Judges order forensic evaluations to provide relevant information regarding the quote, best interests of the children. By the way, that's a really problematic phrase um, that's extraordinarily undefined. And some go far beyond an assessment of whether either party has a mental health condition that has affected the parental behavior. And that's a critical statement because that indicates what the court is seeking from professional psychology is to answer the question whether either party has a mental health condition that has affected their parenting behavior. A mental health condition like a persecutory delusion, um, a thought disorder that is affecting their parenting and what they see in the situation. Um, and that winds up creating an attachment pathology, a false attachment pathology in the child that's affecting their parenting behavior. So clinical psychology is what the court is asking for, but instead they're getting this thing from forensic psychology and they're not getting clinical psychology because we clinical psychology has abandoned the families. We can talk about that in separate places. So the they go on to say that in their analysis, Evaluators may rely on principles and methodologies of dubious validity. And I agree with that. I review these custody evaluations as a consultant in clinical psychology. So that's kind of my profession right now is redu reviewing forensic custody evaluations. I've seen lots and lots of them, and they do rely on principles and methodology of dubious value. I, I think that's being generous. Um, in some cases, in some custody cases, because of a lack of evidence or inability of parties to pay for expensive challenges of an evaluation, defective reports, I've seen many defective reports, can thus escape meaningful scrutiny and are often accepted by the court 
with potentially disastrous consequences for parents and children. Again, I agree with that fully. Um, and uh, by the way, I am that meaningful scrutiny. I'm a clinical psychologist. That's what I'm doing. People, attorneys will bring me these effective uh, forensic reports and ask for a second opinion from the applied knowledge of clinical psychology. So I am that meaningful scrutiny. So what I'm telling you is from that voice and my voice as the meaningful scrutiny is 100% in alignment with what the forensic, uh, what the Blue Ribbon Commission found on about forensic psychologists. And this, what, what these guys are recommending Okay, in their in their experimental new approach that they're recommending can result in potentially disastrous consequences for parents and children. I absolutely agree with that. They go on to say that by an 11 to 9 margin, a majority of commission members favor elimination of forensic custody evaluations entirely arguing that these reports are biased and harmful to children and lack scientific or legal value. At worst, evaluations can be dangerous, particularly in situations of domestic violence and child abuse. This is not Dr. Childress saying this. This is a blue ribbon commission that looked at forensic custody evaluations. And they're finding, they recommend that they be eliminated from the family courts entirely to stop the practice. I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. And making the point that these reports and this practice is harmful to children. This forensic, forensic psychology consultation and child custody litigation is harmful to children and lack scientific and legal value. It's not me saying this. It's the Blue Ribbon Commission saying that what these guys developed, this experimental new approach, um, is, is extraordinarily problematic and, and can be dangerous in situations of domestic violence and child abuse. Holy cow. We need to, we need to yeah, eliminate the practice. These members reached the conclusion that the practice is beyond reform that no amount of training for courts, forensic evaluators, and or other court personnel will successfully fix the bias, inequity, and conflict of interest issues that exist within the system. Again, I agree 100%. The entire field, the system, the system of forensic psychology in the family courts is absolutely broken. It's unfixable. It's based on uh, foundations and premises that are unsupported, and the practice is beyond reform. This is the opinion of Dr. Childress. This is the opinion of the New York Blue Ribbon Commission, who looked at forensic custody evaluations. Now, in forensic psychology in the family courts, is a failed experiment in service delivery to a vulnerable population. That's just a fact. And what people, everyone, the legislators, the psychologists, APA, the parents, children, courts, everybody needs to understand that forensic custody evaluations are an experiment. Classically, in healthcare, diagno do doctors diagnose and treat pathology. And that's what we do as doctors. That's clinical psychology. But Stahl and Simon and these forensic psychologists have left the field of clinical psychology to create something new, something different from their imaginings. And if that experiment works, then yay, they get to be really famous. If it fails, then they're going to be responsible for the consequences. So they're responsible for producing something that's dangerous, potentially harmful uh, to children, that um, and that lacks scientific or legal value. They're responsible for creating that. So you either get the benefits or you get the responsibility when it doesn't work, and it has not worked. It's a failed experiment. And what particularly bothers me as a clinical psychologist 
is that other psychologists conducted an experiment on people and didn't properly kind of do that. Didn't did they didn't educate the general public or the courts or inform them that there is an alternative available from clinical psychology having to do with a clinical diagnostic assessment for possible child abuse. So a clinical diagnostic assessment for possible child abuse can return a, a risk assessment in four to six weeks for around $2,500, $5,000 with a second opinion. These things cost you know, $20,000 to $40,000, take six to nine months to complete, and they still don't render a diagnosis. So even and diagnosis guides treatment. So even after these forensic custody evaluations, we still need another assessment to get a diagnosis so that we know how to treat the pathology in the family. So these are entirely worthless. And yet the forensic psychologists have been making large amounts of money off of the general public on court-ordered mandated reports that solve nothing, that are defective, that um, are harmful to children, that are dangerous even. And, and they're doing this experiment of what they've developed out of their personal imaginings. And I find that really problematic that they didn't inform the courts or the general public that this is an experiment, that they're being used as guinea pigs um, in this situation. So now let's take a look at the, what Dr. Simon and Dr. Stahl say. So there's, there's two versions of their book. You know, 20, 2013 um, is Stahl and Simon, and then second edition is 2020, uh, Simon and Stahl. Uh, so let's take a look at, at what they say. So in 2013, here's that 2013, here's the reference to it, Forensic Psychology cons Consultation in Child Custody Litigation, a handbook for work product review, case presentation, and expert testimony published by the American Bar Association. So they've got the American Bar Association sort of giving their imprimatur of credibility to what these two psychologists are proposing. And then in 2020, they do their second edition of the same basic approach. So by this is for the field of forensic psychology. I know I often say how pro extraordinarily problematic it is. What didn't this drop out of the sky, you know, like mana from, from heaven or something, people developed this approach, this forensic custody evaluation approach. There are specific people who did this and primary among these are Dr. Simon and Stahl, who likely benefited for, for you know, 30, 40 years off of, off of what they've developed uh, in the family courts. So uh, again, to remind you, the Blue Ribbon Commission found what these guys developed to be of dubious validity, that it potentially has disastrous consequences for parents and children. It's harmful to children. It lacks scientific or legal value, and the practice is beyond reform. So this isn't Dr. Childers saying that Blue Ribbon Commissions found that what these guys developed, those are the adjectives they used to describe it. So the origins of forensic psychology, you know, we can probably put it at 30 years formally. It probably it goes back another 10 into the 1980s. But it was not until 1994 that the APA recognized the importance of formalizing guidelines for child custody evaluations when it published its first set of guidelines. And it was not until 2010, 16 years later, that these guidelines were revised. And now we're about 14 years after that, 2024. So we're about 30 years, 1994, 2024. So we got easily 30 years of forensic psychology in the family courts. And this is from their 2013 book. So uh, in 30 years, that's more than enough time for this, for them to get their act together and solve the pathology. It should have been act, act together right away. So maybe two years, five years to kind of formalize up the process. If you're going to propose something new and, and because you got to, 
all these 30 years, you've got children whose lives hang in the balance of your decisions. And you've got the court trying to make these tremendously important decisions around children. And they need feedback from the mental health system. So for 30 years, forensic psychology has been providing this input to the court and protecting the children or not protecting the children relative to the situation. So um, they've what's been going on. So 2013, they say, as a formal and organized field, forensic psychology has entered its adolescence, but it is far from mature. I'm sorry, 2013, and that's 15 years after the formal guidelines, and you're still far from mature? These children need you to be mature these children need protection. They need a, they get this fixed. They don't need you kind of coming up with new approaches and, you know, you're still in your adolescence 15 years after you started. No. And then 2020, their second edition, they say exactly the same thing. You know, so as a formal and organized field, forensic psychology has entered into adolescence, but far from mature. So they haven't made a bit of difference, a bit of progress in the past decade. And they haven't made any progress in the past 30 years. They're still in, in far from mature. They're still in their adolescence, according to them. I would say they're in their childhood or infancy even. Um, they've childhood, toddlerhood, you know, they're, they're rolling around and doing stuff. But holy cow, they're not very organized or effective in what they're doing. Um, now, lest you think, because it's the same words in both places, maybe they just missed it in 2020, and this might be a typo, and they should have taken it out and said, oh, no, we're more advanced in 2020. They say the same thing in other places. So in 2013, these facts serve to illustrate the reality that as an organized field, as an organized sy systematic approach to behavioral science, Forensic psychology remains in its formative years. 2013, it started, if being generous, in 1994. 2013, it's still forming itself. They're still trying to develop what they're doing. And they've left the field of clinical psychology. So, so they don't have any of the structure or support that traditional healthcare would provide. They're doing something entirely different of their own imagination, and they're still forming it 15 years. They've been making money off of it for 15 years as this in their adolescence, and they're, they're far from mature. But then in 2020, they say the same thing, but notice the little wording changes. So they had they edited it. So this is what they're saying in 2020. It's not some sort of typo. <coughs> This illustrates the reality that as an organized field and as an organized systematic approach to behavioral science, forensic psychology remains in its formative years. I'm sorry, I'm done with forensic psychology. 30 years, if you're still developing it after 30 years and we're looking at what you, you're doing, I'm calling scoreboard. Okay, that's a, a sports guy thing. You know, look at the scoreboard, who won, who lost. Simon and Stahl lost. Forensic psychology lost. The pathogen won. We're done. We're done with this approach after 30 years of failure. If they haven't gotten their act together in 30 years, we don't need another 30 years of failure and lost children and lost families. We need to be fixing the problem in the family courts created by these guys telling everybody to do this new approach that doesn't involve diagnosing and treating the pathology in the family. So let's take a look a little bit more. So let's take a look at what they, what they say about the difference between forensic psychology and the clinical psychology. So they, they clearly separate them out themselves out and say, we're doing something different. We are not doing clinical psychology. We're not doing what healthcare does. We're not doctors in the healthcare system. We're doing something different. So if they're going to do something different, if they're going to develop this experiment, they are responsible for the consequences of that experiment. 
And when that consequences go extraordinarily badly, they are responsible for the consequences of what they develop. Failure to take proper care and doing something is negligence. I would say they were negligent in their obligations uh, to, to the children and to the courts. They failed to take proper care, resulting in an approach that is dangerous and potentially uh, harmful to children and uh, with potentially disastrous consequences that and that lack scientific and legal value. Uh, so here's what they say in 2013. So let's see, 2013 they say, because forensic psychology is truly a new field. So 15 years in, I'm, I'm sure all the, the parents in the 20s, in the two, early 2000s, you know, before 2013 are, are happy to hear that what they had applied to them was truly a new field. It's an experiment on you. And we don't know what actually what we're doing, but we're experimenting on your family and your children. So because forensic psychology is truly a new field, Many child custody evaluation evaluators have been trained only in the clinical tradition, <clears throat> bring to their work what we call a clinical mindset rather than a forensic mindset. So they're, they're clearly differentiating out that they are, there's two different branches of professional psychology. Um, clinical thinking and the clinical mindset are no longer thought to be an appropriate approach to forensic psycho psychological work. Now, they don't think it, it's an you know, appropriate approach. I do, and all clinical psychologists do. That's why we stayed clinical psychologists. We're doctors. We diagnose and treat pathology. It's the forensic approach that's not appropriate to pathology. It's not the clinical approach that's inappropriate to the family courts. But that would be my, my argument in, in return to them. But they clear, it's, they're separating themselves out as doing something different. And they say, while there is some overlap between forensic thinking and clinical thinking, we view these modalities as distinct. So this is from the people who are coming up with their own special field of psychology just for parents in the, in, in the family courts, um, their experimental new approach. And they see it, they're not grounding it in any of the clinical approach. They're clearly separating themselves out, exempting themselves from the established scientific and professional knowledge. So they say, despite the clear and convincing argument for the use of, for, of a forensic model when conducting child custody evaluations, there are still those who argue that a clinically informed approach to child custody evaluations is appropriate and preferable. I wouldn't do custody evaluations. I'd say a clinical approach is, is appropriate for all pathology. We want to treat it. It lands on treatment. How do we fix it? That requires a diagnosis. Are we treating cancer or diabetes? And so a clinical approach is relevant to all pathology. So you got the attachment pathology in the family courts, a, a clinical model on how do you fix it, what the treatment is, is the appropriate approach. However, Stahl and Simon, 2013, say, we strongly disagree with the clinically informed approach. So I strongly disagree with the forensic. Oh my goodness, what are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna solve this professional uh, disagreement? Because forensic psychology, oh, now we're over into 2020. Okay. So in 2020, they say, because forensic psychology is truly a new field, Holy cow, we're in 2020 and it's still a new field? They're done. I'm sorry, you're done. You, you destroyed the lives of children and families with your dangerous, harmful, uh, potentially disastrous uh, experimental new approach that lacks scientific and legal value. Blue Ribbon Commission. You've just, so for 30 years you've been doing that and you're saying it's truly still new? You're done. You, you're you failed. It's a failed model of service delivery. Many custody evaluation evaluators have been trained only in the clinical tradition, bring to their work what we call the clinical mindset rather than a forensic mindset. So again, they're still making this exactly the same argument for their existence, despite what we see as clear and convincing argument for using a forensically informed model when conducting child custody evaluations 2020. Um, there are still those who argue, yeah, me that a clinically informed approach to child custody evaluations to pathology 
is appropriate and pre preferable. We disagree with the clinically informed approach. Well, I've gone from strongly to just disagreeing to it, but still it's clear there's a division within professional psychology. And I, I'm arguing that this is needs to be eliminated with along with the Blue Ribbon Commission. They're arguing that we need to do this more of this and that they've been successful. And so we have a disagreement that needs resolution within professional psychology. Um, and again, Blue Ribbon Commission, that what these guys developed, this, they're saying what, what these guys are recommending in their forensic psychology consultation, child custody litigation, the handbook for work product review, case presentation, preparation, and expert testimony, what these guys develop is of dubious validity, has disaster, potentially disastrous consequences for parents and children, is harmful to children, lacks scientific or legal value, and that the practice is beyond reform. Okay. I agree with all of that from my personal experience reading them, but this is what the formal review of the practice determined. So to understand what they developed that is different than clinical psychology, here's what they say about it. Professional whose formal training often revolves around the desire to help those in distress must reorient themselves to a new reality. Okay. To a new reality. They're bringing a new reality to things. That the idea of um, helping people in distress, eliminate their distress, is not the, that reality. Okay. So, and it's not revolves around the desire to help those in distress. That's our job as clinical psychologists. We're doctors. We help people in distress. Okay. That's what we do. That's why we became doctors. And so it's not a desire to help people. That's our job. And, and I would suggest that Dr. Simon and Dr. Stahl have forgotten what the job of a doctor is. So, FMHPs, uh, forensic mental health providers, are not there to help those they evaluate. They do something different. They left clinical psychology. They stopped being doctors. Um, and the, those they evaluate, and their good intentions and desire to do what is right may not be perceived as such by those evalu they evaluate. Yeah, because your good intentions to do what's right don't isn't doing what's right okay you, we don't want your good intentions we want an accurate diagnosis and an effective treatment to fix the pathology in your family all of your good intentions and desire to do what's right is irrelevant okay we need an accurate diagnosis and effective treatment plan this is possible child abuse we need uh, to protect the child from one parent or the other we, we need to get on this so i'm having huge problems with with what they crafted as a professional psychologist, um, that their goal is not to alleviate suffering. The forensic role is a non-helper role. That's a problem. That's a problem for doctors. When a doctor is not there to help the patient, they've gone into the family courts. They've become mini judges. Now the judges have to diagnose what the pathology is because the doctors are not doing their job of diagnosing the pathology and telling the court. They're doing something different. They're trying to do the court's role of determining custody. That's the court's role. Get back to being doctors so that the court can do what it does and the doctors do what they do and we can work the two systems together. The evaluating FMHP, Forensic Mental Health Professional, is not involved in services that have as the goal the alleviation of suffering or discomfort. So the goal of these people in what they do is not to alleviate the suffering of the child. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of done with what they've created because as a clinical psychologist, that as a doctor, we alleviate suffering. And when we have a child who's suffering, Oh my gosh, of, of course the goal is to relieve the suffering of the child because that's in the best interest of the child. You know, even under no definition, that definition is clear. 
alleviating the suffering of the child will be in the best interest of the child, but that's not their goal. They do something different. Okay. So 2020, okay. they say, when the court appoints a mental health professional to conduct a child custody evaluation and offer advisory recommendations to the court regarding the psychological best interests of the child, the evaluator is, in reality, an agent of the state. And so there's my fundamental problem. They stopped being doctors and they went over to the legal system, tried to be many judges and became agents of the state. Doctors should never be agents of the state. Psychologists should never be agents of the state. We should always work in the best interests of our patient, our client, in this case, the child, and, and, and then serve the court by being doctors, by doing what we do, diagnose and treat pathology. That's how we are in service to the court and the court's needs. We don't mess with the court's decisions on child custody. That's up to the court. In the absence of child abuse, parents have the right to parent according to their cultural values, personal values, and religious values. And in the absence of child abuse, each parent should have as much time and involvement with the, the child as possible. The question is, is there child abuse? That's the, the relevant question the court needs an answer for. <clears throat> now, because a good deal of the clinical data is impressionistic, subjective, and not subject to transparent replication, forensic mental health professionals must reorient their thinking away from much of what was learned in graduate school and towards the demands of forensic practice. So that's where they violate standard 2.04 of the APA ethics code that requires them to apply the established scientific and professional knowledge. But here, they've just exempted themselves from the application of all the knowledge they learned in, in graduate school, all the professional knowledge. The established scientific professional knowledge, you know, this stuff you studied in graduate school, remember that? They just say, we, re, we are must reorient away from that to this new thing we're doing. So that's where they set themselves up for the ethical violations and serious problems. Because here's the APA ethics code. The psychologist's work is based upon established scientific and professional knowledge, professional knowledge of the discipline. That's attachment pathology and Bowlby and others, family systems, child abuse and complex trauma, personality disorder pathology, child development, tronic and others, psychological control, barber and others, and the DSM-5 diagnostic system of the American psychiatric. There's your established science. That, that's what we are required, mandated, required to apply as the basis for our scientific and professional judgments. But that's all the information we learned in graduate school and beyond that they've just exempted themselves from. So I will maintain, and when I do their reviews of custody evaluations, this is the one I'm looking for right off the top. Did they apply the established knowledge as a basis for their professional judgments? No, they didn't. Routinely, no. They don't even know the knowledge. That's violation of 2.01, boundaries of competence. So what, what do we have? They put up a straw man regarding clinical psychology that um, were somehow impressionistic um, in saying, let's go back and look at that for a second. They say, because a good deal of clinical data is impressionistic, no, it's not. Okay, no, we apply knowledge. So if I'm looking for a cross-generational coalition and the evidence of that, that's not impressionistic. I'm looking for symptom features. If I'm looking at a, for a possible thought disorder, possible shared delusional disorder, that's a mental status exam, a thought and perception. I'm looking for how they organize into linear logical thinking or don't. That's not impressionistic thinking. That's the application of knowledge. When I'm looking at the attachments networks of the child and they're, they're not motivated to bond, they're motivated to sever, that's an application of attachment knowledge to the symptom information. That's not impressionistic. So that's a lie. I'll, I'll just call that out right now. That's a lie. They're misrepresenting, creating a straw man in order to justify their own, their own existence. Is, they say it's impressionistic. Subjective. No, it's not. 
all things are subjective. However, we limit down the subjectivity in clinical psychology by applying the established knowledge. So all doctors in clinical psychology are required by standard 2.04 to apply the same uh, established knowledge as the basis for our professional judgments. So then we have a, a commonality by which we can discuss the pathology and whether or not it's present or absent. It's not subjective. Diagnosis is the application of the of diagnostic criteria to the symptom information. It's a pattern match of, of diagnostic criteria, the symptom information. That's not subjective. The diagnostic criteria are what they are. The symptoms are what they are. That's a lie. So they're creating a full-on um, straw man to justify their own existence. And they say, and not subject to transparent replication. That's a lie. Second opinion. That's the appellate system for a, a disputed diagnosis in healthcare. If you dispute the autism diagnosis, you got to collect the symptoms, apply the diagnostic criteria. So it is in massively subject to transparent replication in clinical psychology or diagnosis. What isn't uh, subject to transparent replication are six to nine month evaluations that cost twenty to forty thousand dollars. You can't get a second opinion on that. And it is entirely subjective because they're just applying their own opinions, applying no established knowledge. And it's just impressionistic. How would I like this one, parent? I agree with this one. I don't like this one. I don't. I'll call projection on all three of those as they tried to come up with the justification for their ex experience. And this is 2020. They're saying this. And I'll challenge all three of them as being uh, false representations about what clinical psychology is. So let me tell you what clinical psychology actually is. And because clinical psychology needs to return to the, the family courts. Diagnosis guides treatment. Okay, that's all of healthcare. Clinical psychologists are doctors in the healthcare system. That we treat pathology, we fix things. And diagnosis guides treatment. And the only reason we need the diagnosis is because the, you know, we need to figure out what we're treating. The treatment for cancer is different than the treatment for diabetes. So diagnosis guides treatment. Are we treating cancer or diabetes? And that's why diagnosis comes into play. But ultimately, we always land on treatment. How do we fix things? We have a severe attachment pathology in the, chi in the child. The, you know, the, the child's rejecting a parent. How do we fix that? We got to fix it because that's really bad pathology is destroying the kid's attachment networks. So whatever the cause of that is, we need to identify the cause, diagnose the cause, and then we come up with an effective treatment plan to fix the cause. That's, that's clinical psychology and right? all of healthcare. The differential diagnosis in the family courts is that either, um, you know, is the targeted parent abusing the child in some way, thereby creating the child's attachment pathology towards that parent, so that's one possibility uh, causing it, or is the allied parent psychologically abusing the child by creating a shared persecutory delusion, an induced persecutory delusion, and false or factitious attachment pathology in the child for secondary gain to the pathological parent of manipulating the court's decisions regarding child custody and to meet that parent's own emotional and psychological needs. So there's your differential diagnosis in clinical psychology. So now we conduct uh, a proper risk assessment to answer which one of those is causing the child's attachment pathology. And there's ways you can do that. You know, you get the, you collect the child's symptoms and you start pattern matching symptoms to various diagnostic uh, issues of concern. So in all cases of severe attachment pathology surrounding court-involved custody conflict, a proper risk assessment for child abuse needs to be conducted to the appropriate differential diagnosis for each parent. So we, we, we just know that. So if, if the court says having this, these families come back and these high custody conflict, custody litigation stuff, the court should be kicking that out to get a proper risk assessment from the doctors uh, regarding is there child abuse and if there is, which parent, and if there's severe attachment pathology, we're going to be looking at a child abuse diagnosis, one, one parent or the other.
because that's the only thing that causes severe attachment pathology. The attachment system is a, is, is a goal-corrected motivational system. It's a primary motivational system of the brain. And so it's always goal-corrected to bond to the parent because it, a breached attachment bond exposes a child to predation, to predators. So the predators are eating these kids and taking their genes out of the gene pool. So we have a primary motivational system of the brain that's strongly motivated to form a, a secure attachment bond to the parent. Um, so if, if we get a breach like this where the child is seeking to not bond to the parent, well, the only cause of that is abusive range parenting, either by that parent or psychological abuse um, and the false factitious attachment pathology created by a shared persecutory delusion from the pathological parent. Negligence. So we got that, that there's problematic practices within forensic psychology. Are, they, is, are the practices of the forensic psychologist negligent? Uh, and so Google negligence, that's failure to take proper care in doing something. And then a more formal definition at a Cornell Law School uh, is that negligence, uh, and this is up on their website, um, negligence is the failure to behave with the level of care that a reasonable person would have exercised under the same circumstances. So we got possible child abuse. Did they conduct a proper risk assessment, proper care? Did they conduct a proper risk assessment for possible child abuse? Because that's the only thing that causes the pathology that's getting referred to them. Either the person's actions or omissions of actions can be found negligent. Okay, so the omission of actions is considered negligent only when the person had a duty to act. So for example, a duty to help someone because of one's previous conduct. The duty in this case for the psychologist, for the forensic psychologist, is a duty to protect. All, all psychologists, all doctors have two legally obligating duties, duty of care and duty to protect. And there's three types of dangerous pathology, suicide, homicide, and abuse, child abuse, spousal abuse, elder abuse. Those are called dangerous pathologies. Whenever we encounter a dangerous pathology, we have a duty to protect obligation um, that becomes active, and we are required to either conduct a proper risk assessment or ensure that a proper risk assessment gets conducted. If we run into a suicidal patient, we have to conduct a risk assessment for suicide, or we have to get them to an ER where they can conduct a proper risk assessment for suicide. We have to do something. We, we have a duty to protect obligation that needs to be discharged. I would argue that that's what this forensic approach fails. And I would say it's a negligent failure. The, the negligent failure, they should fail to take proper care uh, regarding their duty to protect obligations in by not conducting a proper risk assessment and returning a diagnosis and discussing that diagnosis with the judge. They don't even discuss a possibility of child abuse in their reports. I read them. They don't discuss a possibility of a shared delusion. They don't discuss a possibility of cross-generational coalitions. They don't even consider it. So I, I'd put it in the domain of, of negligent malpractice. And and here, and, and you know, it's not, okay, so I have an opinion uh, from, from my work and review of the forensic custody evaluations. I get to read them line by line. But here's people who did an outside review, Blue Ribbon Commission, by an 11 to 9 margin, a majority of the commissioners, commission members favor elimination of forensic custody evaluations entirely, um, arguing that these reports are biased and harmful to children and lack scientific or legal value. That's pretty much a full sweep. Um, at worst, evaluations can be dangerous particularly in situations of domestic violence or child abuse. That's pretty damning critique. Um, and again, I agree with it entirely. The differential diagnosis, um, and do doctors should always remain doctors. Doctors diagnose and treat pathology. Doctors should not decide on child custody schedules. In the absence of child abuse, parents have the right to parent according to their cultural values, personal values, religious values, 
And in the absence of child abuse, each parent should have as much time and involvement with the child as possible. Custody decisions are the court's consideration. What's the of concern to the doctors, to the clinical psychologists, all psychologists, um, is whether there's child abuse and by which parent. Um, so we need to return to a focus on diagnosis so what we can come up with effective treatment plans. So is there child abuse? Is the targeted parent abusing the child or is the allied parent psychologically abusing the child? So in conclusion, uh, just as I run down the field of forensic psychology that was created by these people, Stahl and Simon, here's what they do. That's what they do. They're the ones who create it and train others and teach people how to do this. Um, the forensic psychology in the family courts is a failed experiment and service delivery to a vulnerable population. So if they get the credit for success, um, they also get the responsibility for failure. And when the failure is substantial, um, when they left the field of health care and clinical psychology and started to do something different, if their new experimental approach uh, resulted in the failure to protect tens of thousands of children and their parents from abuse and the destruction of tens of thousands of children's lives across decades, if that's the, the result of their um, new experiment and service delivery, they bear the responsibility of that as well, I would think. So um, I, I'm going to be headed off next to take a look at their vitas. So let's see who Dr. Simon and Saul are. Uh, they came up with this model that we've been using in the family courts for 30 years and has been, a, in my view and the view of the Blue Ribbon Commission, a complete and utter failure. Um, and from worse than failure, it's dangerous and harmful to children. Um, and so I would recommend um, as well that we get an online moderated debate with Stoller, Simon, and Dr. Childress, uh, the role of forensic and clinical psychology in the family courts. I'll take the role of clinical psychology and say we need to return and forensic psychology needs to end as a practice. And then they can defend their model and and uh, say why that's not true in their mind and why they've been successful over 30 years um, and why there's not still a new approach in its, you know, far from mature and it's, and it's still in its formative phases after 30 years. So I, that's what I would recommend. I don't like doing this, you know, video by video on different sides and everybody's fine. Let's put up an online uh, moderated debates and let's start discussing the professional issues so that everybody can can evaluate what those issues are. The courts, the mental health people in the family courts, the you know, attorneys, the parents, children, all of them can go online with, with these debates and look at the professional issues involved. We need to get the American Psychological Association over here because everything's an absolute mess created by the collapse and the failure of forensic psychology. Because no clinical psychologist will work in the family courts. It's too dangerous. And they're not competent in the family courts. They've been gone for 30 years. So they're not, they're not um, competent in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders in the family courts uh, or the personality disorder in the, in the family courts or the family systems in the family courts um, or the attachment pathology in the family courts. The clinical psychologists have been working with all this other stuff. And so to get back in here, they're going to need some additional training um, relative to the areas that they're not up to speed on. So right now, the family courts and going forward, the family courts are not going to have any competent mental health services. So all the children and all the uh, parents and the courts are not going to have competent mental health services. In my view, they never did. Uh, boundaries of competence 2.01 and applied knowledge 2.04. But I'm willing to to debate this with anybody who disagrees with me on this. I think that's an appropriate forum to do that. I'm in, but you got to get somebody to take the other side. Um, I would recommend that the, the moderated debate, uh, the place I'd like to it could be is come out of a law school. And I'd like to see it sponsored by like the law school graduate students, maybe get the site graduate school to co-sponsor 
um, uh, you know, an online moderated, moderated debate, the role of forensic and clinical psychology in the family courts. Stahl and Simon clearly say they disagree with a clinical approach and they slam my field and say we're subjective and, you know, we're not replicable and all these sorts of things. Well, they're attacking me. Well, I'm attacking them. I'm saying they're lack scientific you know, and legal value and are harmful to children. So let's let's put those arguments side by side and see what what, what happens with that. That's what I would recommend. But I need somebody to take the other side. So with that, I'm going to be moving over now to actually taking a look at the vetas of Dr. Simon and Dr. Stone. 